I want to start with um, what we're actually trying to do, which is basically create um, good coaches, which are in the end going to lead to um, good, solid free flyers who are going to be safe, etc., etc. That's kind of where we. That's that's the whole point of all of this. Um, and along with that, pick up a whole load of good free fly tips. Now, we've probably all had the old experience where you're free flying and someone from potentially another drop zone hasn't been coached by one of our guys. And you kind of go, what the hell are you doing? You know, this, you, you've just about managed to sort of hold the sit and someone has signed you off. Congratulations, you've held the sit for life position. But after that, it's like your safety concerns have disappeared out of the window. Um, at Donk as well now, if you wanted to do a sit fly jump, they'd actually tell you that you're, so you, you're not allowed to do one unless you have a coach. You have to have FF1. Well, you have to do, a, to do one, just a practice. Yeah. No, to the practice you need a, a brief, an, an FF brief. Ah, uh, right, okay. Not a coach okay. jump. Just, <coughs> so you don't okay. end up killing someone by backsliding. Yeah. So they had somebody backsliding, you know, up the the flight line, and then there's some other theories on it as well, the kind of good enough separation and all this kind of stuff. That's why it is most uh, odd and into everyone else. Um, the answer is with a bit of knowledge, none of this stuff is going to happen, it just isn't. It's quite interesting if you look on the BPA website, you've got uh, six um, uh, stages to your SIP line and pressure. And actually, they're pretty good. Um, what they don't necessarily do is, is, they, is they kind of break it down from a point of view of let's assume we haven't got a wind tunnel and let's assume someone doesn't have any, any skills at all. So it does break it down into you know, a uh, back fly basic position and then a, a jump which is just turns and then a jump that is uh, just stand and then a jump that is stand turns and then it puts it all together and makes it all happen. There's, there's a way which you can kind of go with this without using any, any tunnel skills at all. Um, the reality is that we all use a tunnel, you're about to use a tunnel. Um, the tunnel is going to save you a lot of heartache and a lot of jumps. Um, and that's just the reality of it. And jumps in this country are harder to come across than wind tunnels, so we tend to use the wind tunnels, which is fair enough. Firstly, let's start off with a uh, kit. All right. Let's say, for example, um, and this is good information for you as well. But we're talking it from a from a coaching point of view. If a student first comes to you with kit that is really big, so they want relatively low jump numbers, and they've still got a very very big kit, chances are that's not going to help their free fly skills in any capacity, whether it's back fly, sit fly, or whatever. Um, it's going to end up hindering. So this is this is one of the reasons why it sort of tends to go hand in hand with the sort of sort of slightly higher jump numbers, slightly smaller kit just makes all of this easier. The next bit is how we put the, the kit on. Um, a lot of people don't pay any attention to this stuff. So firstly, the, the rig needs to fit you. And if it doesn't fit you, if it's too big, then sit line and back line are going to be almost impossible. So if you have a look at someone's kit, you can see that it's basically just not going to work. And you, one of the, the telltale signs is your uh, shoulder strap should come down basically over, over your nipples. And as you tighten up that, those shoulder straps, it shouldn't really be able to pull in very much. It should be hugging the whole of your body. A lot of FS kit, which is designed to be um, nice and free and open can be massively too big and it just doesn't matter and, and actually that's more comfortable it allows people to arch which gives them greater range with this stuff if we can tighten up the chest strap and end up with our shoulder straps you know coming closer and closer together then that then translates into the rest of it and that translates into it probably being stopping around from you um, I'm going to show you how I put on I read every time now. And it's how I know for some of you guys you're like, how do you do it? But this is how I do it, and this is a lot of people don't know how to do this stuff. If 
if I just stand here, okay, and I just tighten up all this stuff, then I'm tightening it up. Um, I'm tightening it up while I'm in a, in a standing position. And I'm only really going to manage to get this done up a certain amount. And also the whole rig is not going to be in, in the right place on the body. So that is now that is now about as tight as I can get it. So if you have a look at how close that is to there, that, that section now, a couple of inches there. But this is a good fitting rig, right? And then as far as this bit goes, as I'm pulling that up, that's, that's now really tight. I'm super snug. However, the moment I go to, to sit down, I've now got some, some movement in this whole thing. And that's a bit that would, on a bigger rig, if this didn't fit me quite so well, that would cause me some issues. So the way to, to make this even better is you slacken off the chest strap, okay, and put your foot up onto something, push all of this around, and then tighten it up from there. Instantly I've gained another two inches on this. The same thing on the other side, pushing that around like that, putting your foot up onto something, and you gain another bit more. Does it feel any less comfortable because of the way I've pushed it around? Put my chest strap up. And now when I sit down, it's, it's, it's absolutely work solid on there. Absolutely solid. So that method of, of doing the leg straps up is absolutely crucial. Um, somebody's first mission on this is, to come, is going to be to learn how to backfly. So chances are someone's going to come to you and they're going to say, okay, I'd like to backfly. <clears throat> if their rig isn't fitting them and it stops over to the side, you can almost guarantee that what's going to happen is they're going to, they're going to be spinning. Like straight away, that, but that rig's going to stop to the side a little bit. And that person's going to be, be spinning. It's not even their fault. You know, the rig's too big. So, They'll come down after having a very, very fast spinning, spinning jump, and you know they probably would have found it very hard to control it. So that's the first thing. If that side of it isn't going to work, then you've just got to say, "Look, buddy, I know you've come with your own kit, and that's great, and you've got a brilliant jumpsuit, but the trouble is that rig's too big. We're going to do a backfly jump or a sidefly jump. It's going to massively hinder you." that you need to sort out first before we bother going any further. My first set of kit was just too big for me and it was, it was nice for FS, really big and baggy and everything else, um, but it was just too big. I then stopped jumping, worked in the wind tunnel, came back to skydiving with some free fly abilities and I found sit flying in the sky almost impossible. Right. I was like, why is this so difficult? It was just because my kit was too big. Changed my kit for something that actually I perceived at the time to be much, much too small. Next thing you know, I was like, this is exactly the same as a tunnel now. This is actually how it, how it feels in the tunnel because the rig fits properly. So <clears throat> that side of it needs to, be, needs to happen first. The next bit is someone really should do at least one jump with a, a ditter. So if someone's come straight from, from doing FS and no ditters, I think it would be a bit crazy to do a, a backfly jump with the, as the first person's experience of using a ditter in a helmet is when they're actually upside down. I have no reference between the beeps and the, and the altitude and all this kind of stuff. So I'd recommend to go and buy yourself a ditter, go and do a flat jump, get used to the fact that this thing's going to be beeping at you and check it so it beeps at whatever you've set it at and you check your altimeter and you sort of correspond the two things together so you actually know what the beeps are doing and what it means when, you, when you've got those in free fall. Um, anything better than one ditter is two and if you're going to do anything upside down on your head you require two anyway so in a way if you've, if you've got the cash 
by two jitters right from the start and done with it. Um, the next thing is going to be uh, them and how they're dressed. So when people first start free flying, they go, oh, it's gone. I've got my t-shirt on, I've got my jeans on. So naturally enough, and it's, it's all obvious to you guys, and you all know because you've got all suits, but the moment we, we start to free fly with, with a t-shirt on or something like that, even if we tuck it in, it's okay, my belt's really tight. It's like, oh, okay, you are gonna be traveling at maybe 150 miles an hour. Is it really gonna hold it in 150? I mean, is that really, can you really guarantee that? I mean, that's why it's a walking fun suit, isn't it? And the thing's gonna lift it up and, and cover the handles, you know, in the worst case scenario. So, <clears throat> it, it just pays to, to get a suit. You know what? If you're, I know what people are trying to do when they first start this, kind of go, well, because I don't want to spend much money on I've already spent a lot of money on skydiving. So they don't want to go out and buy a suit and that kind of thing. You don't even have to have a suit that fits you particularly well. But an all-in-one suit, to me, with leg loops, is a bit of a minimum requirement for this stuff. When we're talking about uh, the backfly and briefing them for the backfly stuff, um, straight away, the, the standard sort of uh, toggle on a, on a container, they're usually all right, you know, and a lot of people jump them and there's not an issue with, with the standard, the standard um, a hacky. But at the end of the day, a hacky has that ability to, to flop from side to side. Now, if I take this and I flop it from side to side, obviously I'm pulling it a little bit for the sake of this, but it's coming out, you know, every time it flops from side to side, it is slightly coming out. And it only takes sort of a strange sort of set of circumstances, you're in the aeroplane and you, you pull it and it, and it just is a little bit further out than usual. So as a general rule, the hacky is not, it's not your ideal creature for, for this kind of stuff. Uh, the hug is definitely a much better beast. It's a flat item that sits underneath the elastic and everything else. Um, your next element is obviously going to be, is it really free fly friendly? Uh, well, this one clearly is, because it's sort of designed for the job. Um, traditionally, your free fly friendly rig actually has the flap coming from underneath. Um, and that way, when you sit flying, it's, it, it's that all the forces are actually pushing it and keeping it close. This one actually is sort of going the other way, and it's just so tight in there that it's just not going to be an issue. Um, you're checking somebody's kit, you've got all the usual stuff, alright, um, which you don't need to go over. But let's face it, guys, if that man's closing loop is looking warm, he has a premature on his back or in a sit at higher speed. It's going to be really ugly, it's going to be really nasty. The other thing is, you know, this is a man's pin pushed in all the way. Because again, premature at these sort of high speeds, it's, it's not going to be nice. So when you're checking the pin, you're not just looking for is it smiling, green in a window, you're looking for the quality of the, the closing loop and the, and the quality of this. And it's, it's actually too late when we get on the flight line. You know, it's like, well, what are you going to say to the guy? No, you can't jump because you're close to people. It's a bit afraid. Whereas, if it's a half an hour beforehand, you've, you've got an opportunity to fix it. And it just isn't really worth it. It just isn't.